you know, I, 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 I personally felt a little odd about it. I don't know about you, Shadi. That last episode. Oh wow! So we're we're really going there. I think so. I think it's the oh, it's wow. the right way to do it. Our, our listeners are really gonna like this because I, you know, this is a bit of a surprise to me. Well, I mean, you know, I I, I think the the thing that I I like most about this podcast is uh is the uh the honesty right the <laughs> and uh I, I i think it's important you know so so we recorded live with ben haddad last last uh week uh and it went well uh we recorded in your living room and uh there were some you know people were bugging me when we published uh you know where is it etc and there was some uh, technical element to getting the sound right because without boring our audience, you know, it's a different room. I'm not used to it. I had to bring my gear over to your place. And so, you know, just glitches and things that I needed to sort out. But, you know, it's, we even sort of were, were joking about it in the episode. There's a kind of, there's a kind of uh, sense of guilt that you're doing it because you're, you're, you're transgressing. I mean, I think I said in the episode something like sinning. Um, but we did it, and you know, I thought it came out really well. But then, um, you know, our our friend Ben got the sniffles, <laughs> <laughs> and I thought to myself, "Man, we are uh, we're gonna have a um, we might get nominated for the Darwin Awards, right?" Because <laughs> <laughs> the episode ends up, and and uh, and uh, we all have COVID. But anyway, I just figured, you know, uh, I saw you were tweeting about um, some stuff about uh mitigation uh, strategies and, and, you know, what's possible here and the rest of this. But I just, I figured it might not be a bad way to kick this off before we, we get to that a little bit by just uh, uh, working through some of that a bit. I mean, we worked through a bit of it on the podcast talking about uh, the weird sort of situation and, and a little bit of the sort of social pressures surrounding this. But I, I the last week has been sort of an interesting uh, experience just for me working through our last episode, basically. So I don't know how how did how did you how did you parse all of uh, all of the last week? Yeah. So j- just to be straight up, um, well, I haven't listened to the episode with Ben yet. I was in it, so in that sense, I sort of know what we talked about. But um, and and the worry that I had, and I, I don't know to what extent this will this will be obvious when people listen to it. Um, we joked a little, I don't want to say joke, but you know, we had a bit of a, a bit of a lighthearted back and forth about the fact that we were in the same room, uh, the three of us in, in my living room. And yeah, we were social distancing, but we were doing something which I think some people would frown upon and, and judge us on and I think that all three of us were okay with that. I mean, we have, I think we, each of the three of us have a particular approach to dealing with fears around COVID and we've made decisions and we'll stand by them. And we're not going to apologize for our particular approach. That said, <laughs> where it takes a little bit of a turn, as you said, Demir, is that Ben got the sniffles uh, a couple days after that. And I think for the, You know, for the first time, it really dawned on me. It's always like an abstraction or a theoretical possibility that we, of course, we know we can get COVID at any particular time just by walking out, going to the grocery store, um, going in a car, an Uber, whatever it might be. Um, But to actually be faced with the prospect that, okay, well, first of all, a friend, uh, a close friend of ours um, is worried And because we interacted with him during this time, then there's a real chance that we would get it as well. And that, I think, raises a lot of interesting ethical questions. And Demir, when you um, when we saw those texts from Ben over the weekend on Sunday, actually, uh, we were going back and forth on text me and you because I was I was freaking out a little bit. Yeah. And I wasn't sure what to do. And I wasn't sure like what the ethics like there are ethical concerns as well that if you interacted um, with anyone else in close quarters, you got to notify them that you may have been exposed to someone who worries they might have COVID. So it becomes this sort of um, like, uh, you know, six degrees of separation thing that, you know, there's a risk of spreading it outward. And you have to you have to think about um, who else might be at risk because of that. 
And for that reason, you know, we we were like, oh, shit, should we release this episode? I mean, what if Ben gets COVID? Um, then this episode is going to be kind of weird. Um, being out there in the public as part of the, you know, the, the, you know, the wisdom of crowds history. Um, so, and I suppose it's still possible that Ben could get coronavirus or that me or you, I mean, it's always possible. So we might very well, you know, who knows, there is a chance that we would look back on this episode in the weeks or months to come and we'll have a different conversation around it then about, oh, did we make a mistake? Was this right? Did we have the right approach? Were we taking enough precautions? So it, it's really fascinating to kind of like, it, it's one thing to talk about ethical abstractions. It's quite another to talk about it when, you know, you might be a spreader yourself, you know? Right. <clears throat> I mean, from wisdom of crowds to the uh, foolishness of individuals, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Look, um, for my part, I this whole this whole uh, time, I, I again, I you know, everyone has different risk profiles and appetites. I I don't I don't care if I get it. I I kind of want to get it. I that, so for me, what's so interesting about it is sort of what you're alluding to is this whole sort of ethical dimension of it. Now, obviously, you know, uh, if it's just on a question of of individual, um, it's not uh, a big deal. I think. Um, but we, we aren't individuals. We live in society, and so our decisions impact others. The other sort of meta question about this, and this is what kind of haunted me more about it um, than even some of these sort of uh, interpersonal questions about informing, is again, you know, um, uh, it's. I think we we did this maybe two episodes ago. It's what is the what is the what is our role, even as sort of minor minorly public figures. Uh, about you know uh, I don't know setting an example I don't know how you want to, what you want to call it but but here we are we were we were flaunting technically an order even though as we noted in the episode uh, anecdotally we uh, we know many are similarly making narrow exceptions to this to just basically cope to get through a very difficult situation and and carving out sort of social exceptions for themselves and and then you know justifying it one way or the other i mean we're guilty of the exact same thing in many ways um justifying self-justifying so i don't know it's uh it's it's an interesting time to be doing all of this and and yeah and then on top of it is is sort of what you said i'll, I'll just put it even more bluntly it's uh it's a bit of vanity on my part it's it's uh, how how stupid will we look if how stupid will I look when I end up on a respirator, you know, after after an episode like this and how reckless and dumb and and all the rest of it. Um, that's and I, I say that purely from vanity, not from a oh, I, you know, I'll do anything to avoid getting this in many ways. I'm, I'm torn and I I I, um, I I would I would love to be able to say that I had a two weeks of this and I have the antibodies and then, you know, every following eruption of this within our social circle or anything, uh, I can just be concerned for the other person's health and, and not worry about myself and not worry about myself spreading it and, um, uh, or having any sort of broader, uh, impact on others. You know, I can just, I can just be helpful and not be a source of potential extra infection. So I don't know, that's a lot, but that's, that's sort of how I, uh, how I was digesting the last yeah. week. And you bring up an in interesting point. We're not just two random people. That would be one thing. But, it, well, I mean, we have this podcast, so we're, we're saying this with the intention that other people will hear it. But also in our other writings and public engagement, you know, I don't want to overstate the number of people who listen to us or follow our advice or wisdom, so to speak. But there is also this, you know, kind of social responsibility as people who are in the public sphere and there's always a question, you know, how how open should one be about such things? I do think it's important to be um, to kind of speak frankly about the trade offs and challenges and tensions. That's part of why we have this podcast to have those difficult conversations, because I, I, I know like anecdotally, but also just like seeing what people are saying on Twitter, that a lot of people are struggling with what the right balance is. And not and and not to get. I mean, most of the people I know socially in D.C. 
the more and more you talk to them privately, the more they admit that they are making certain exceptions. They are meeting up with a small number of friends. Um, and we talked last time about, you know, there was this article in The Guardian about how if we want to sustain social distancing over the long run, that people might organize into social pods where they have uh, three to five close friends and trusted friends and they kind of self-monitor and they they see each other once a week or whatever it might be. And that's how they get through this in the coming months. And even some countries are moving to actually formalize this in certain ways. I read something about Belgium actually doing an allowance for you know, something like there's uh, up to 10 people. I don't know how th- how this would actually work, but there's some talk about like having uh, 10 people that you interact with and the social, whatever. Yeah. But th- this is the same basic idea that you have a small number of people that you keep on meeting with because there's no other way to live. And, and the key thing here is sustainability in terms of having an approach that can last more than a month or two at a time. So anyone who comes and says to me, um, oh my God, you're interacting socially with a couple people. Um, I just don't have any time for that COVID scolding because first of all, there's a lot of people who are lying about what they do or don't do. And um, there are many people who are um, interacting with others on walks, one-on-one in close quarters and doing that with multiple people. So is it effectively different? So on and so forth. Um, but Ultimately, these are personal decisions, and every individual, um, you know, should try to find, should try to figure out what can work for them. And um, the shaming thing was maybe fine in the first few weeks, where shame actually could be effective in creating certain new norms around dealing with this virus. But I think we're entering into another stage of this where shame and stigma could actually produce more and more of a backlash. And we're seeing that how people are saying, well, Hey, this is not going to work. You know, you can't expect us to accept this indefinitely. And we should note that mayor Bowser here in DC just announced an extension of, of, um, of whatever you want to call it lockdown until, um, I guess June 8th. And, um, I, I'm not, I don't, I have questions about that decision because and I did a tweet thread about this earlier that, um, well, part of the point of extending lockdown and, and doing it is that you have more time to develop a coherent strategy around testing and tracing. So you're, you're trying to make use of the time that you have under lockdown, but it doesn't seem like we're making huge strides on those metrics, testing, and tracing. So if we keep on extending and extending, but it's not part of a clear, coherent, long-term strategy to actually deal with this virus in a serious way, then it's almost like you have the worst of both worlds, that you you have the imposition and the inconvenience of lockdown without the actual benefits of developing a strategy under lockdown. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I, I I think it might have been the same tweet thread, or maybe it was a previous one you did, and this is what what I wanted to talk to you about today. Um, you you uh, you're piggybacking off of um, uh, an a, a Korean American journalist in Seoul, I believe, in his sort of uh, you know quick Twitter account of what it's like over there. Um, and you know what struck me about that? Uh, so the Koreans are doing a much better job, and and in many ways they've developed what you're saying. You know, ideally we would have been able to develop. And I'll let you talk about you know your own conflicted feelings about how likely it is that we develop something like that. But let me just jump in before we get to that, and that's to uh, to note that part of this whole narrative throughout this whole thing. And I, I think it's reflected in markets too, badly enough, which just tells us that like it's some kind of, I think, collective psychosis or just an inability to process reality that they're behaving the way they are at all. Um, but there was this feeling that we need to do X, Y, and Z, and we will go back to normal. And then in at least the popular media coverage is, 
you know, again, and we've discussed this in previous episodes as well, it's it's partly, well, you know, Trump is uh, a dangerous moron. He's going to get us all killed. Um, and if only we did X, Y, and Z, we would be closer to the ideal, the platonic ideal of democratic solutions, uh, which is Germany uh, and or South Korea. Now, leave Germany aside, and they're actually having a lot of blowback now, and, and even though they are in a much better place on testing, but, you know, a lot of pushback on on um, on their their sort of, uh, you know, social distancing regimes and, and how that's going to play out, who knows? It's, it's worth watching. What really jumped out at me in that Twitter thread about South Korea is that it's nothing. They've, like, quote-unquote, beaten the virus, though they haven't. But they have, it's nothing like back to normal. In fact, it's a state of siege that they've implemented. They're just less socially up in arms over it. Um, and, you know, one can uh, do sort of armchair uh, uh, culture sort of, you know, which I think sometimes uh, borders on racist kind of <laughs> assumptions about why uh, such and such is behaving in such and such a way. I would say largely because they had the experience of SARS and, and uh, they, they are, cult, you know, historically within living memory, they have, they've had to deal with this sort of stuff. Uh, regardless of why, uh, they are submitting to a very uh, abnormal, unnatural, you know, nothing like it was before lifestyle. And again, you want I'll to say let, a bit about what that about that lifestyle, just because you said state of siege, but maybe we should be more clear sure. About- sure, we'll put we'll put the tweet uh, your your thread and 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 uh, I forget the the uh, the journalist's uh, thread in the show notes, but um, it's uh, levels of social monitoring. Uh, you know, you arrive. Uh, what really jumped out at me I was in like the second or third tweet of his thing said, you know. Not only do they force you to put an app on your phone, okay, fine, they also install an ankle bracelet on you um, for your 14 days of quarantine. So, you know, in case you think you're going to be smart and leave your phone at home uh, to, you know, go gallivant for a little bit, no, it's 14 days. It's not 14 days of, you know, how we do stuff, which is like, oh, well, you can walk to the store and, you know, you know, get your physical exercise because, you know, that's so important. No, 14 days, you are locked into a room. They ship you food. Uh, they monitor you. You have to check in twice onto your app. If you don't, you're, uh, well, I don't know exactly what the penalties are for that. He does say it's $10,000 $10, fine if you're caught breaking quarantine on this, and they're tracking you, you know. That's not normal. Now, after those 14 days, um, yeah, okay, maybe it life's a little bit more open, even though, you know, their opening up of cafes and, and bars and the rest of this has caused another little spike in, in Korea, and they're freaking out and locking down uh, stuff down again. But, um, you know, there's there's uh, notifications, and since they're tracking you with your, your app and the rest of this, you are notified if you were in the area with someone, and then if you were in that area, you know, again, there's a chance you will have to lock down again if you're identified to have been in close contact, you will be locked down again for 14 days. So again, you know, this is not status quo ante. And this is this is best case scenario here. That's the thing that really jumped out at me from that. That's that's what success looks like. I, and people should let that sink in. Yeah. And that's why. So when I saw that thread describing the South Korean approach, my initial instinct was, wow, in my ideal world, I wish we could be like South Korea and get our act together and have this pretty serious, strict re- uh, regimen that, you know, that monitors people effect, you know, effectively and so on. But then there was a part of me that was like, fuck no, we're American. <laughs> so right. That's a sort of oversimplification of my inner conflict, you know, but to be more serious about it and explain what I mean here, I think that, and this is where I do think that political culture is important. And, you know, I add the word political to culture because, you know, culture is even more complicated and that gets into sort of um, the question of what is inherent about a group or a people. And, you know, it's, this is not about essentialism. It's about, how politics and culture interact. So when we talk about American political culture, we can talk about a very polarized and combative public sphere. 
Um, South Korea has some of that. They've had large scale protests in recent years and so on. So it's not to say that there isn't conflictual politics, but I think it's fair to say that the South Korean public discourse, but for even that matter, the, the German public discourse, at least until recently, was not at the level of our And we talked about this last time, that there is something more open and vibrant about the American public debate about responding to COVID than in much than much of the rest of the world. And I feel like I'm really proud that we have that because that's what makes our democracy so great is that it's this cacophony of conflicting opinions and you have a wide range of approaches to different questions, but there is a dark side. And this is where I get conflicted because it does inhibit our ability to develop a a more effective collective response to a crisis like this. Um, So then it raises the question, can we be great as Americans? Can America be great for the reasons that we are great? but not also have these negative trade-offs. I mean, you can't really, and this gets into a a bigger philosophical question, are are aspects of what makes us great um, inextricably tied to the things that make us worse? And that there's really no way to separate those two completely. You can't have, so to speak, your cake and eat it too. Yeah, yeah. Again, echoes of previous discussions. Um, you know, I, 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 uh, I'm less perturbed than some of my friends about uh, America underperforming. And let me just put it this way: Yes, of course, I think everything you say is true. Like, there's things that we're going to be uh, better at for political, cultural reasons for. All sorts of reasons. I mean, political culture is also a very broad term, but, you know, big country, uh, I don't know, just very hard to manage something like this, more decentralized in in many ways, Um, lower state capacity, whatever. I guess what jumped out at me about the Korean case is that it's, you know, the Koreans are managing it in their own way, but... And I guess, you know, uh, if you are, your entire measure is saving lives, which is a fine measure, but, you know, uh, there's, in no sense are the Koreans on top of this in the sense of, like, restoring life to normal uh, better than we are, except in the fact that, you know, they have fewer cases. I mean, they've, they've, they're managing the death toll. Life is not getting back to normal. That to me, and maybe this is just my own sort of weird um, preoccupation, but I feel it in in all sorts of other things, especially, as I said, and how people talk about the economy, also in general about how people talk about like, oh, well, we just need to do X, Y, and Z, and then we're out of the woods. No, no, no. No one's out of the woods. The Koreans aren't out of the woods. Yeah, they're, they're on the margins saving more lives. That's not nothing, and it's enviable, but... uh. As you say, you know, I think some of these things are unfathomable the way they're approaching it within our society is just simply impossible. Um, but but again, much more important to keep in mind, no one's figured this out, you know, like they figured it out again on the margins for for uh, uh, saving lives on the margins, but nothing like getting out of this and getting back to normal. Normal is as far away as it's ever been. That to me was the big Okay, Demir, this is where I, I might take I might take issue a little bit in that, yeah, South Korea's death toll is microscopic compared to ours. That is a huge that is a huge difference. We do actually know how to reduce deaths, and that maybe isn't everything, but it's pretty important. And I just don't think that can be well. It depends what your metric is. If the metric is what does normal life look like, and can we get back to that? then we're all going to be in a sim- similar place until there's a vaccine of not getting back to quote unquote normal. But if you prioritize at least until a, va- a vaccine comes, limiting the number of deaths to the extent possible without destroying the economy altogether, then South Korea, Australia, New Zealand, Germany 
are all doing a lot better, a lot better than we are. And, you know, I do think that one of the, one of the top, one of the most important responsibilities of political leadership is to save American lives. And I would also apply that in foreign policy. If someone attacks us abroad at a U.S. military base or U.S. embassy and even one American dies or one American political prisoner dies in a prison in Egypt, that to me is a non-negotiable and that requires a vigorous response just for one person. Of course, being being killed by a virus is different in that there are different philosophical questions around intent and responsibility and who's ultimately responsible for those deaths. But I think it's I think that's a very I mean, in, in some sense, that should take precedence for any elected government. Fair. Um, <laughs> I guess. Like, no, yeah. I mean, I guess I, I no. I again. Yeah, sure. Sure. Uh, I don't I contest zero of that still. I think it it ends up oversimplifying the problem. Um, part of it is, I think, what I was addressing or trying to address is a kind of uh, it's a kind of unreality to everything that's going on, and I think it's tied to this idea that if only X, then we're good. And I the I think it's important for people to focus deeply and profoundly on what good in the best case scenario. And let's let's posit that South Korea is the best case scenario, what that looks like. Let that sink in, really embrace that and understand what we're up against, first and foremost. Then, as you were doing in your thread, I think it's important to think of why why some of those solutions are quite simply impossible in this country. That's two. Uh, And then three, you know, again, we we went at this a while before. Let's do it again. I, I, it's... It's not just a body count. That's the wrong way to think about this. This is a crisis that's so much more than a virus killing people. It is so disruptive, and the knock-on effects of the disruption are only now starting to come into shape, even though, I don't know, I don't know when we recorded the podcast when I was particularly dark on that, but I, from memory, I still feel pretty strongly that that reads and sounds pretty good today. Perhaps the South Korean... Uh, model is the only way that we can get a, you know, a modicum of productivity and maybe even consumer confidence back into the economy, which will prevent a certain kind of of uh, lingering uh, recession slash depression, which will have untold effects on generations. Um, uh, and maybe that's the only way. But then we need to also come to grips with the fact that that many of those ways are just simply inaccessible to us. Now, again, let me just say, None of thing, nothing that I've said so far should be construed as apologia for lack of direction. I, I said it in the last episode as well for the fact that this time was not used to figure out a uh, responsible testing regime. That's the other thing that really jumped out for, uh, uh, out at me at that in that Twitter thread, right, was that he said the main difference between South Korea and what they're doing and the United States is that in South Korea— he, as an individual, does not have to worry very much about uh, other people having it and not knowing it, and therefore that is a huge burden, and he can be more normal. That's one thing, and this is why you know getting back to the the question of the uh, of the the wisdom or folly of recording uh, the previous podcast in the same room with Ben. Uh, we don't know. We still don't know. Uh, you know whether any of us are carriers, and we have no reason to feel confident in that. That's bad. And that is very much um, a failure, a policy failure, a failure of us to be able to do that. Um, But uh, again, I I push back very strongly on this idea that the only and most important metric is somehow lives in this. It's so much bigger. And I, 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 I hope over time people can come to appreciate how much bigger and how much more messed up a situation this is than than merely merely I say even as I don't know how what are we up to in number of deaths globally even even as that that number keeps rising inexorably yeah so t- so two points i mean the first thing uh, um just a reader just so <laughs> listeners know what we're talking about so um I think that the issue here in the U.S., and I talked about this in that thread, is an in-between state um, where 
so it's great that we have a federalist system, right? But the problem that I think we're seeing more and more is that um, it's great that we don't have to rely on a bad central um, silly leader like Donald Trump on the national level and that localities and states are doing their own thing. And that's why we see considerable variation. But the problem is um, while states have considerable jurisdiction, they don't have considerable capacity or legitimacy. So we're in this weird situation where we we don't want to be dependent on Donald Trump. But at the same time, when um, a municipality or a state says, hey, you guys should stay at home, they don't really have they can't really enforce that and people aren't necessarily going to listen. So there, there ends up being no way to have fully implemented lockdowns. And this is one that's really dawned on me as I have looked at examples in other countries. And my colleague, Amanda Sloat has a good piece on this, I think in Politico, where she talked to like 70 friends and acquaintances all throughout the world about how they're dealing with this. And for the first time, it really dawned on me, a lot of the rest of the world, at least for a certain period of time, have done strict, enforceable, enforced lockdowns, where it even gets like very, very specific that you can't go more than like one mile or or half of a mile away from your house without written permission. And then someone has to um, sign off on this trip and your neighbor, you know, really, really intense stuff. There is not a single state in the U S even hard blue states that have gone, that have actually had full lockdowns. So that's why it suggests to me that there is an institutional issue about state capacity, but then we have to ask ourselves a deeper question why is it that even in the most anti-Trump blue states, we're not able as Americans to go the full extent? And that's where I think we have to talk about the role of culture. That's just one thing because we've sort of been alluding to it. And I just wanted to be like, wanted to lay that out a little bit. But on another point, if we're doomed to be in this state of non-normalcy, then we have pretty much two choices. We can have non-normalcy with a lot of deaths or non-normalcy with a small number of deaths. And I would prefer the latter. And this is where I think South Korea has a huge advantage. So if we're all doomed to what you say, Demir, if we have this pessimistic outlook and that people have been over-optimistic about how quickly we'll get back to some, some modicum of normalcy, if we can't do that, then shouldn't the priority be um, limiting the loss of life for uh, for the meantime. Is there a third option? I guess the third option, which isn't even really normal, is Sweden, which is accept a high number of deaths. Um, in their neighborhood, they have, uh, I think, either one of the highest per capita, certainly compared to Finland and Norway, they have by far highest uh, highest per capita in that kind of narrow neighborhood um, in Scandinavia as well as, you know, Denmark. Um, so, uh, but they still have bars and restaurants open and most stores and people can kind of go about and decide whether or not they're comfortable being in a restaurant and so on and so forth. Um, I guess that's a third option, but that's not even really normal because restaurants are still at relatively low capacity um, people still aren't comfortable going out the way they used to before. So there there really is no normal option available to us for the foreseeable future. I mean, that's what even the Swedish model would suggest. Yeah. Look, I I'm I'm, you know, in my deep pessimism, I'm not I'm not one to be calling for normalcy. I just I think it's important that people embrace the fact that it's not coming back anytime soon until we have a vaccine. I mean, I think it really is that simple. Um let me ask you, uh, there's a lot of good stuff there. Let me just ask you one question first. Uh, how surprised are you that, let's just talk about Washington since we both know it since we live here, when they locked it, when when the announcements came and they, they it looks like Mayor uh, Bowser and uh, 
uh, Governor Hogan in Maryland and, and uh, oh gosh, I forget the governor of, of Virginia right now. Uh, but they, 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 they synchronized their, their lockdown announcement, however many months ago that was, weeks ago at this point. Yeah. Um, I remember they announced fines in Washington, D.C. Um, and, you know, of course, they, they created the, the loophole for exercise. Uh, but I remember even going on Twitter at the time and saying, like, uh, unless you start finding people for walking around and ask them for it, I mean, you know, this is this is this is mostly uh, what was it called? Like, not I don't know if I called it pandemic theater, but like kind of like security theater, the equivalent of, you know, it's it's we're serious about this. It's really, a, you know, do your part, et cetera, et cetera. But but no, no desire to to enforce it. And you were saying in there, Shadi, maybe maybe. Uh, Maybe it's not it's not exactly how you meant it, but it's not it's not so much that the power has to reside in the federal government for people to take that seriously. You can enforce that rule very locally. You just have to find people. You know what? Like all it takes, you don't have to find hundreds of of people to do this. Find 30 people on the first day. Give them a fine of five thousand dollars. If you want to be like particularly uh, egregious about it, but have the most impact, go into like wealthy communities and get people who can afford $5,000, arrest them, find them, perp walk them in front of cameras, let, <laughs> and let, and let it be written that the DC government is dead serious about enforcing its quarantine. It's on the books. It's on the books that we can get $5,000 for being outside. Right. Okay. So Amir, when you've laid that out, this, this is where I realize that I have a sort of an American vaguely libertarian core to me. When you describe that, yeah. I almost like I've been recoiling in semi horror that that's so contrary to how I understand. Like, I just I can't even get my head around that conceptually. In the sense that it seems like um, an infringement on personal freedom. Of course, um, it's totally understandable that you would find people, especially let's say you have like an obvious case of five people um, walking together and not social distancing, or they're in a park and they're just like having a little like mini party. There could be obvious cases where you would find people like that and find them. Um, but it just seems un-American to me. And I, let me clarify just so I, I don't think that anyone who listens to this would find that particularly controversial, but certainly some people on Twitter would that, um, you know, it's not un-American. It's only un-American in a kind of instinctual gut way that we don't like the government to tell us what to do. And especially not a state government or a city government. Like that's not how we see the role of the DC government. Or if you live in Virginia, that's not the role that you see for your state. You know, I'm born and raised in, in, in Pennsylvania. If the governor of Pennsylvania is going around with the National Guard and finding or arresting people who are outside in parks or whatever, or too close together, or walking around without a good reason, I'd be like, what? That's not how I understand the role of my state government. And for that matter, is it even the role... Like at least with federal government, fed, the U.S. government has a kind of legitimacy where it's an elected, democratically accountable government. I still say it is. Um, sorry, <laughs> I still say it is. And um, you know, there at least there is legitimacy. That is something that the federal government can do in times of emergencies, and sometimes there is a kind of. Um, trade off that sometimes even like post nine eleven. I mean, I was opposed to a lot of that with the Patriot Act, and but you still have to respect the law. And there's an argument to be made that the federal government has jurisdiction to take certain actions, even if we as individual citizens might disagree on civil li on civil libertarian grounds. So that's why, like when you're describing that, I'm like Demir, whoa, finding people five thousand dollars and perp walking them. Like I don't know in Georgetown, I don't know if that's where you had in mind. <laughs> yes, It'd be a funny sight. Um, so uh, well, but but that's interesting, right? That you say that the the federal government has more legitimacy when it's so much further away from the average citizen. Arguably, you know, the governor, the mayor, uh, that's someone who's in your life. You know, there's this just reminds me. There's that great photo that was circulating about. 
uh, some guy accosting Boris Johnson in a park. Uh, I don't know if you saw that one. Uh, it's just oh, yeah. like, you know, they're, they're like well afar, but he's just sort of pointing and clearly cussing him out. And Johnson looks disheveled and, you know, just, but I, I love that photo. And it's, it's, uh, it's in a way that's the ideal of democracy is, is and in smaller countries, not that Britain's a small country, but in smaller countries, you know, I, I just remember even back, uh, uh, I don't think this happens anymore, but for a while there in Croatia, uh, the the president would just basically go have coffee at this one place, and you'd go you'd go have coffee with the president on Saturday. You know, eh, if you wanted to, you'd go there. He's just some dude sitting in the corner. Um, that that's 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 democracy, and that's legitimacy. And in many ways, in a big and 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 unruly country like this, I why why we ascribe more legitimacy. I'm not saying you're you're wrong to feel that way, but it, it's it's a signal of something that you think that only a distant, uh, again, in especially in polarized times when you have so much less, especially coming from D.C. where your vote doesn't count. That somehow that's the legitimacy resides necessarily at the federal level on something like this. Why not the governor? Why not at the state level be able to enforce this? Um, but let me just say one other uh, uh, thing. Um, yeah, go on. Go ahead. React to that. Yeah. So, Demir, like the little uh, the little thing you mentioned, I guess, um, the encounter in the park with Prime Minister Boris Johnson. I mean, first of all, I think you're right that it's so unimaginable for an American, the idea that someone could just go up to the head of government and just be like, hey, I'm not cool with your policy. And Boris Johnson is just like twiddling about in the park. And I think he has maybe like one bodyguard or one person that's like a few feet from him. But otherwise, he just seems like a normal guy with a cup of coffee. I don't uh, I guess I don't even know how he got the cup of coffee from Costa which so maybe they reopened um, cafes for takeout or whatever. But um, so, but, but you raise an interesting point, like why I'm, I'm more comfortable with a distant federal government doing something than with my local government. But I think the answer is actually kind of easy. I don't have any loyalty or allegiance to the DC government. I'm not even a DC native. I mean, I, I love DC. And I now consider it to be my home, but I don't really know much about how DC government works. Um, I have to confess that I haven't been great about voting in local elections. Um, you know, even, even when I was, you know, even when I think about Pennsylvania, like my state of origin, do I have any allegiance as a Pennsylvanian do I even see myself in those terms? No, I don't. Maybe other people in other states feel more strongly about these things. I guess Texans probably do. But the only, the real allegiance I feel is to America, which, and to me, America is represented by the federal government for better or worse. Yeah. Yeah. What do you think about what? How do you? Does that make sense? Or? No, I mean, it makes sense. I, I think <laughs> you'll, you'll just, you'll just hear, you'll just get a lot of people, uh, pointing to what you just said and said like you know this is this is this is part of the political decay that America uh, is suffering from that like I mean arguably arguably since since the Civil War it's been a, a process of centralizing arguably as well as as uh, uh, colleague mentor Frank Fukuyama has argued as well it's like you know it's 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 part of the modernization of America and the the, the growing up of states is is a certain level of centralization. This gets back to to basically you know the bigger the question that we started on with all of this right is is the question of um, what's possible in terms of state capacity in in uh, in dealing with this crisis that we're in right now right and what's possible in the United States versus what what is possible in other countries and i just wanted to get back to to one point uh to maybe you know try and draw us into full circle as we approach one hour here oh no devere <laughs> i'm so sad <laughs> don't worry shoddy i mean i think i think i hope i hope this uh this new uh uh tempo that we're setting here will uh will last a little longer so we can uh, we can we can continue the conversation. Yeah, so word of warning to our fans, we're going to do this like all the time. Yeah. That's at least our ambition. By all the time we just kind of mean once a week instead of once every couple of weeks. No, indeed. No, so so look, I mean um you were saying it's it's I, I think you put it nicely, but I just want to complicate it a bit. You put it nicely. You said something along the lines of 
Uh, grant, I grant you uh, that normalcy is not coming back, so we can have an abnormal situation with fewer lives uh, lost versus an abnormal situation uh, with more lives lost. And again, I, 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 the, the, I don't want to sound like a like a, a red state Republican heartless person here, but I do think that's oversimplifying it again because because um, what we have is maybe maybe think of it in terms of like three vectors. One is is just the innate state capacity. Part of it is is just like a developed bureaucracy. Part of it is this political culture that you're talking about, America versus another place. Um, but there's 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 the ability to tackle a challenge like this on a state level. That's on the one hand. Uh, then on the other hand, you have, I think, a balance, and it's a balance that uh, on the one hand will be set by state capacity. That is to say, the balance is going to be addressed differently in a place like South Korea than the United States. But nevertheless, given the abnormalcy of it, it's it's going to be a balance. And that is the balance of the reality that we have to balance economic activity with lives. That's a nasty balance, and I think a lack of state capacity that we have here makes it a much dirtier, messier, unpleasant, uh, perhaps divisive as a result, extra divisive process, because uh, it's going to have to be both, and it's going to have to be done on a particularly, uh, we're going to do it much more blindly than, than better capacitated societies. I think that's what it is. It's going to be a lot blinder, and that's bad. That's bad. Um, I just, I just, you know, it, I recoil from this idea that it's, it's it, oh, it's going to be abnormal. We just have to save lives. It's not that, con- it's not that simple. That's oversimplifying it. It's, mu- it's a much nastier problem than that. I guess that's the, the main point that I, I, I sort of uh, want to sort of leave with in any case here. Yeah. And so, but I, I kind of agree. And this is where I think here's my ideal state. I mean, um, my ideal state would be one where we have, you know, better and somewhat more aggressive, aggressive testing and tracing, but without the sometimes seemingly authoritarian approaches of like South Korea, where it's kind of invasive and there are individual liberty issues that are pretty obvious in that case. So better testing, better tracing. We start as soon as possible, reopening restaurants and cafes and having outdoor seating, not indoor and stop car traffic and have more space. You you know, I'm sort of obsessed with this idea of stopping car traffic on 14th Street here in DC, which for those of for those of you who you know haven't been to DC, is one of the main social thoroughfares, and there's a lot of restaurants, bars, and cafes. And you you have you know social distancing appropriate tables and dis and you know six feet gaps and all that stuff, and then you have some DC officials monitoring that from afar in a non non invasive way, and that way you have a more sustainable approach where people start living again. And then you have a more targeted approach where you pay closer attention to nursing homes, assisted living facility, facilities, jails, other places where people are gathered very close together. And you have a pretty serious, you, 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 you try to just have a more surgical approach. I think I, I don't see why that, why something which sounds to me sounds to me somewhat modest and i guess this is close to the german model why why can't we do that and this is where i do have a kind of fatalism as an american that hey we're great and because we're so great it also makes us suck in other ways fine okay there is that sense of fatalism and i have to fight against that to some extent and that's where i say hey we can be at least a little bit better and here's how, and I just, so this is where I get frustrated. Why can't we do that, Demir? Well, I don't know. Uh, seems reasonable to me. Uh, <laughs> you know, the, 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 the challenge ultimately is, is the testing problem. I mean, you know, I... Why I, is that I, so hard? Largely because, I mean, the, 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 a truly successful testing regime probably looks more like South Korea uh, than Germany. I'm, you know, I think the interesting thing to watch maybe going forward is uh is how germany uh more rambunctious um you know democracy 
uh, that's, uh, in fact, in many ways, much less centralized than most people, you know, that, that don't follow Germany really appreciate, um, who did manage to get on top of it and who, you know, uh, by and large, that they, they have a reputation for competence. I wonder, it's going to be interesting to watch how they cope with this. Um, you know, again, I'm, as I've said many times before, I'm not into this sort of uh, comparative body count as a metric. Um, but I think I think Germany is a, is a very interesting uh, case to watch. Uh, and, um, you know, we'll see. I, 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 I wonder how much less of an invasive testing regime than South Korea you can have uh, and, you know, to build up that confidence, which again, that Twitter thread, I think nicely, nicely encapsulates a competence, uh, a confidence among citizenry to know that things are more, more or less in hand and they can go about their lives more or less through inconvenience. And that gets you enough of uh, momentum for, you know, uh, a normal economic recovery. Uh, obviously, since that level of in, in, intrusiveness is inaccessible to us and perhaps even to Germans, uh, let's see, let's see what we can do. Uh, I think that's, that's the long and short of it. Yeah. So, in re- so I know we're running out of time, so I'll just, uh, maybe in these can, these can be threads that we can unpack maybe a little bit more in future episodes. So when it comes to Germany, this is where I, so the fact that we're much more polarized along partisan lines, where it's, we're sort of like a 50-50 country, Germany, almost by definition, because it's a parliamentary system, is never going to be polarized in quite that way. So you can have rambunctious political debates and far right parties, which they certainly do have, but they're not going to have a situation where um, one half of the country is like, oh, we like our president. Another half is like, we will never trust him even when he's doing the right thing. So I think that puts us at a certain kind of disadvantage. But the other thing is as, as rambunctious as, as Germany can be, they don't have the kind of like, fuck you, don't tread on me kind of vibe, which we do have. And again, this is, forgive me my culturalism here, Demir, but I do think that all of us as American, just by ver- virtue of being here, being born here, or immigrating here and buying into the American dream, there is this sense of like, fuck you, um, to kind of, you know, say it in a little bit stark terms. Um, And maybe again, it's an oversimplification. But um, I, as far as I know, and I'm not going to claim that I know German culture in and out. um, Uh, But I don't think we can say that Germany has that same tradition of don't tread on me. Yeah, look, I, 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 I'm, I'm no Germanist either. Um, I, I do think it's, we do know know certain things about Germany. Some things. I love their beer. Look, I mean, here's the thing. I, I, uh, uh, let's leave it open on that. I mean, I think it's interesting how, how the sort of the, that kind of reaction to authority is, is, uh is being given voice across the West now. Uh, I, you know, one way to describe our populist moment that occurred to me the other day um, is, uh, you know, the birth of true democracy is the other one, which is, which is just basically, you know, as more and more people learn to be heard and partly through technology, uh, they're having less and less of it, less and less of the idea of expertise and, and central authority and the rest of this. And it's just under undercutting legitimacy. Maybe that's one way to think about populism, and so that would, you know, be my soft reaction against the idea that that we are so unique in our in our in our don't tread on meism. But I think it's a fair point, Shadi. I, it's it's a uh, uh, well, something to unpack unpack more for next time. Yeah, uh, for sure, because yeah. we're running out of time this time. Anyway, yeah. good chatting. Okay, but I, Demir, I just I just want to say. I'm really happy that we're doing this. <laughs> <laughs> I am too. And you know, again, to our to our readers, as a, as a final uh, parting shot, we're definitely not doing this in the same room today. Oh yeah. Oh yes. Yeah. So <laughs> I'm I'm literally all alone. Yes. No. Seriously. <laughs> anyway, a pleasure, Shadi. Talk soon. Okay. All right. Bye. bye.